Hi, I'm Clay Smith. I'm the literary director of the San Antonio Book Festival. Really happy to be here today with Edmund White, uh, one of our living legendary writers. Um, so he and I are going to talk for a little bit. He has a new novel titled A Saint from Texas. Um, it's a really fun read, uh, and I encourage you to buy it from Nowhere Bookshop, which is the new indie bookstore in San Antonio. Um, you can get there by just clicking on the buy the book link um, in the session details uh, on Edmund's um, page on our site, and it will take you directly to Nowhere Bookshop where you can purchase it. I um, also want to remind you all to post your questions uh, for Edmund in the Q&A box, uh, and we will try to get as many of your questions answered as we can. So let me tell you a little bit about Edmund. He is the author of many novels, including A Boy's Own Story, The Beautiful Room is Empty, The Farewell Symphony, and Our Young Man. His nonfiction includes City Boy, Inside a Pearl, The Unpunished Vice, and other memoirs, The Flaneur about Paris, and literary biographies and essays. He was named the 2018 winner of the Penn Saubella Award for Achievement in American Fiction, and he received the National Book Foundation's 2019 Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters. His new novel is titled A Saint from Texas, and he lives in New York. So, Edmund, welcome to the San Antonio Book Festival. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, people who have followed your books or your career know that you've lived in New York, You've lived in Paris. You've lived in Paris actually for quite a while. Um, but, you know, I, I think when you think of the name Edwin White, you don't necessarily think of Texas. Um, so uh, tell people a little bit about your background in this state and how you came to write this novel. Well, my uh, father was uh, from Denton, Texas, and his father was uh, the dean of students for Texas State College for Women, and uh, and uh, my father became a, a, an engineer and eventually moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. And but my uh, my mother's parents, my mother's last name was Tedley, and her grandparents were homesteaders, and they had a place not far from Stephenville, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we spent a lot of time in Texas. I, I only lived in Texas one year when I was in third grade. And I lived in Dallas, but I, uh, every, every few months we would go from Cincinnati and then later from Chicago to uh, Texas. I can remember yeah. those long car rides. Yeah. So, um, in a saint from Texas, in the beginning pages of the novel, there is, um, you really feel um, sort of the dustiness and the emptiness, um, both literal emptiness and sort of spiritual emptiness of this tiny place where Yvonne and Yvette grow up. And we should say that Yvonne and Yvette are identical twins who um, pursue very different paths in life. Um, one, we could say, follows the pleasures um, of this world moves to Paris, the other goes in the exact opposite extreme uh, to um, Columbia, where she becomes a nun. Um, but it's here in Texas um, where they start out. And so you, you mentioned um, your, your family's um, sort of roots near Stephenville and didn't, are, are those, I mean, they seem like those were the places you were thinking about when you... I, I, I was thinking the very first scene are in ranger texas and i misplaced it i put it in east texas and it's actually in central texas so uh -huh. I, I stand corrected but uh anyway that's where my we'll have to go back and fix the whole book would you i hope you would <laughs> do it my mother's mother uh and her husband who my mother's mother was uh her her first husband had died of malaria while working on the railroads that were being put down in, uh, to Houston, mm -hmm. and it was all swamps in those days. And mm -hmm. um, then she remarried a, 
a, a college professor uh, and uh, Mr. Snyder, and uh, and they lived in Ranger, Texas, and it was really a, a dusty little town that had a kind of torn sign over the street saying oil capital of the world mm -hmm. and it had been for about 10 years before the wells ran dry i think yeah yeah so um give us a little bit of sort of set, set the scene about this novel what what happens in it um for for any of our listeners who haven't um who haven't read it yet and that'll be most of them uh I uh, well, um, <clears throat> the, the 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 children's mother likes to read uh, uh, fan magazines for the movies, and she likes she falls in love with the names Ivan and Yvette, but she doesn't know how they're pronounced, so she names her daughters Yvon and Yvette, and then by the time they get to be too old uh, and they find out how they should really be said. They don't want to change them. They they go on calling themselves that. But uh, uh, one of them uh, is very interested in fashion. She's a sorority girl at the University of Texas. And then she goes uh, just for her junior year abroad to Paris. It's in the 50s. And, uh, and she stays because she marries... Uh, a kind of penniless baron who's rather awful. She has lots of money. She's oil rich. And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, she's kind of a bartered bride. And he turns out the baron to be an absolutely horrible person. And uh, But they have a couple of children with very weird medieval French names. And uh, anyway, all of her money is, is 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 drained by her husband into restoring the family chateau. The other sister uh, goes off, as you mentioned, to Colombia. She becomes a nun, a, a sort of um, a kind of a, a progressive nun, if, if there is such a thing. I mean, in the sense that she is very close to the a priest who who. Uh, who is a a, a a kind of revolutionary uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and she has her own adventures which are uh, pretty heretical I suppose but anyway she constantly writes uh, her her baroness sister and so we keep up with every episode of her life as well and uh, from her letters and uh, and eventually she visits uh, her sister in France uh, with another nun. And uh, anyway, uh, it, I had a lot of fun uh, writing it. I mean, it's uh, uh, because the, when I first arrived in Paris, I was a, a friend of mine made me go with him to a, a three-star restaurant, which I wasn't ready for because I just come off a thousand mile uh, car trip and I was dirty and I didn't want to go there. And there sitting at the next table were 12 people, all Parisian, all speaking French, all elegant, all wearing black and diamonds. And, and one of them got up to go to the Lou and they all broke into English. They were all from Texas. And uh, uh -huh. but they were like uh, exact people rich people who lived in tech in Dallas because uh, I mean in Paris because uh, Texans love uh, Paris and uh, they oftentimes go there and many of them speak French and certainly the ones who are resettled there by their businesses and um, anyway <laughs> I thought that was such a funny thing that these enviable uh, Parisians turned out all to be Texans but uh, yeah. Anyway, that she she has a very Parisian life. I worked for Vogue, uh, American Vogue, for ten years in 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 Paris, and so I met lots of the kind of people that I write about, and um, so that was fun for me to recycle. 
just as the humble Texas beginnings were were fun for me to recycle too. Yeah. It does seem like, I mean, you had a lot of fun with this novel. I mean, that's, you know, I don't know that that's saying something unique about this novel in, in the whole breadth of your career, because one thing that I do admire about your books, whether it's, um, you know, your fiction or nonfiction, is that you do always seem to be having fun, even if you're talking about quite literary or serious um, things. So I guess I just mean that there's kind of a, like a prickly devilish wit to your writing, whatever you're writing in, in whatever genre. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think so. I laugh when I write, but you know, <laughs> uh, I, I think people reading alone at home oftentimes don't see the humor and unless they're, uh, but sometimes when they go to readings and the author is there and the author is laughing at his own joke, uh, I think I, I used to see that with the poet James Merrill, whose poetry is really funny. But uh, I think when he would laugh, it would give the audience permission to laugh. They hadn't thought mm -hmm. that it was meant to be funny before. Right. Yeah. When you read poetry, you're not, uh, I think a lot of people in the audience think you're supposed to be extremely serious. <laughs> serious, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of. Um, somebody said that uh, my novel seemed like a 19th century novel because there is a murder and a, and there is adultery, and there's child abuse, and there, uh, and there's ecstatic religion, and there are lots of other <laughs> uh, things that seem pretty extreme, I think, to modern readers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there, there's some there's some extreme stuff there, but it's also I mean, in the I mean, you do have so much fun with it. So I don't want to get too, you know, literary or serious, I guess. But the, the you know, the sister who goes for the pleasures of this world and she certainly has a conscience. I mean, I'm not, you know, um, she's not like a Las Vegas showgirl or something. She's she's very intelligent and principled um, and she can't stand it that her barren husband who comes from really old money, but doesn't really have any money. And she's new money that he's sort of, you know, sucking it, all of her oil fortune out of her. And yet her sister goes for another extreme, sort of a life of penitence um, and prayer. Um, and so clearly you, you are having fun with um, the vices and the virtues of this world, right? Yeah. Well, I, I'm an atheist myself and always have been. But uh, I'm I was I'm very intrigued by religion, and uh, Michael, my friend whom you met, is the same way. I mean, he's a militant atheist, but he's fascinated by religion, and he knows everything about it, and mm -hmm. always is reading religious texts. Anyway, so uh, I thought it would be fun to, for me, as an atheist, to write about a saint, uh, because. Uh, and so I read like 10 million devotional books and, uh, and, and I really got into the spirit. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's the kind of stretching that writers like to do, which isn't very popular anymore. You're supposed to stay in your lane now and only write about what you know. Otherwise, you're seen as poaching on somebody else's territory. But I think that's a silly point of view because I think writers really like to uh, embrace other lives and see things from another point of view. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, Ann Tyler has a great quote that it's something to the effect that like the reason she became a writer is so she could have more than one life. Yeah, I think that's right. Another thing I think that's nice about being a writer and I've never seen it really mentioned is that it ties your days together. Uh, it's a little like having a love affair. I mean, that you, uh, maybe an unhappy love affair where you think about the other person all the time and uh, and you, uh, but that does sort of give you a project. Uh, I, I mean, scientists have projects and scholars have projects and mathematicians have projects, but 
writers uh, are lucky that they have the project of writing a book. And I, as soon as I finish one, I can't wait to start another one. Mm -hmm. And that's why I probably overwrite. I've written 30 books. Well, that's a gift. I mean, I know so many writers and they they would die for that to, to be prolific, you know? Yeah, you're, you're right. Well, uh, I mean, I, have you watched this Hemingway thing on TV? The, uh, the, it just came out. I haven't watched it yet, but I've, I'm It's I'm really great, it. I think. And uh, mm -hmm. Hemingway is a writer I admire vastly. And, uh, and you know, everybody, the cliche now among leftist people is that uh, he was just a bully and a drunk and, and only liked to hunt and watch bullfights. And that is all part of his personality, but there's also a very tragic part of his personality. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's interesting to see. But he was a very disciplined writer. He would get up every morning and start writing. Yeah. So what do you think about the sort of scandalous part of the um, documentary that don't they go, I don't think I went to something about the sex roles that Hemingway. Oh, yes. But, you know, anybody who's read his posthumous novel, The Garden of Eden, already knows about that because, it, you know, in that the, the hero and his wife, um, both dye their hair blonde, and she has her hair cut by his barber, so it exactly resembles his. And they uh, they role play in bed. I mean, sometimes he's the girl and she's the boy. And but I think most couples who have an exciting uh, sex life go go through all those stages or go through similar ones. And mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, uh, it, I love that book, The Garden of Eden, which has gotten pretty bad press because it's a posthumous novel and an editor kind of cobbled it all together. I I actually read that novel with uh, Ed Hemingway, the Hemingway's grandson, and the two of us had an affair in Key West one year, and we, we read that book together, and he, he loved it. It was his favorite book by his grandfather because it was so liberated and crazy. He Hemingway himself thought it could never be published in his own lifetime because it was mm -hmm. too scandalous. And yeah. he told me that his his mother, Ed Hemingway's mother, um, uh, was the secretary for the old man. She was Irish. And uh, she said that that book, The Garden of Eden, was his five finger exercise every morning before he would get down to his serious writing, he would write that book. And it was mm -hmm. just sort of like uh, doing scales for the piano. And and of course it's his best book, I think. Yeah. No, that's interesting. So, you know, um a saying from Texas is so evocative of Paris. Um as I said earlier, you you lived for quite a while in Paris. You um, have a book called The Flaneur. When you're clearly fascinated by French culture, I um, lit my France candle uh -huh. in your honor here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I've written, I wrote a big fat biography of the French writer Jean Genet. And yeah. And I wrote two slender biographies, one of Rimbaud and one of Proust. And mm -hmm. so uh, I've written three biographies, all of French gay men. <laughs> But yeah. uh, anyway, I, uh, I I am fascinated, and I loved writing the Genet book because that took seven years of research, really. And mm -hmm. so I, I knew Paris fairly well, but I knew nothing about France until I wrote that book. But I had to phone up on the French military and the French um, prison system because uh, Genet was a prisoner many, most a third of his life. And, uh, and, and the laws, and uh, it was an enormous research project. And then he traveled everywhere. He, he was a friend of the Black Panthers. 
and they came here and I interviewed quite a few Panthers and um, mm -hmm. and and he was a friend of the Palestinians and I interviewed quite a few of the Palestinians. Anyway, I, I learned a lot writing that book. I'm not sure it's a good book, but uh, it was fun to write. And so what, what drew you to France in the first place? Do you remember? I always had a dream of Paris. I think like a lot of, I'm 81. I think a lot of gay men of my generation in America had a fantasy about Europe that they would be accepted there and that they were more evolved and more sophisticated. I'm not sure that's true, but it, it was a fantasy at least and that and that fantasy is what drew me there. And then once I was there, it was like heaven. I mean, I just, I found it heavenly. Uh, I mean, so beautiful and the food is so great and the people I believe are so charming. I know they have a bad reputation. Everybody says France would be great if it weren't for the French, but that's just because the French um, are slow to warm up because mm -hmm. whereas Americans move constantly and so they have to be friendly right away. The French make on, on, move only once in their life from the provinces to Paris. Mm -hmm. And then, so they're very reluctant to make friends because in France, a friend is a friend for life. And mm -hmm. you don't just drop them the way you do in America. I mean, the cliche about Americans is that yeah. you, you're closer to them and you know more about them after one meeting than you will after the one year. Uh, and that they, they open up, they're very friendly but they're not really good friends. And uh, the French are not very friendly, but they're excellent friends who are loyal to death. I mean, like if you were broke, they would give you all their money. Mm -hmm. No, it's nice. Asa saw, you said something else in another interview comparing American and French people that um, the more sort of elite or high class you are in America, the less you are allowed to talk about sex. And the more elite you are in France, the more you talk about sex. <laughs> yeah, but, well, the, well, the the joke is that uh, American Americans talk about uh, money, so they won't have to talk about sex, and the French <laughs> talk about sex, so they won't have to talk about money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, people seldom talk. Also, the French are really bad at introducing people, whereas Americans are quite good at it. But, uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, because they assume everybody who's anybody already knows everybody in Paris. So mm -hmm. it would be an insult to introduce them to somebody else. Uh, so, uh, you know, you'll sit next to a, a, a really charming person, and then when she gets up to go, it turns out she's a famous movie star but nobody ever bothered to tell you that and yeah. um, so anyway uh, it, the, the two cultures are extremely different from each other I think and but they're becoming more more alike than they used to be I mean for well, a long time uh, France didn't have the me too movement but now it mm -hmm. does vengeance yeah. Yeah, no, it's um there have been all the stories about, you know, um French publishing and intellectual circles and uh yeah. you know, the bad behavior that's gone on and yeah. um yeah. but I mean you 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 spent I think sixteen years you said in, in France. What if it was so great, what what brought you back to America? You came to teach, right? Or... Well my husband, Michael, uh, uh didn't like it there. He, he never really learned French properly. He only lived there three years. And um, he wanted to be a writer in New York. He's much, he's 25 years younger than I am. And so um, he had different goals. And uh, my friends, I don't know, I, I, I think we would spend a lot of time with French speaking evening and that irritated him. Anyway, then I got, uh, I wanted to get a job in Austin, Texas, 
but they wouldn't have me because of my scarlet reputation as a as a homosexual. So uh, mm-hmm. they uh, so I w- was forced to go to Princeton. Forced. Um, so when you um, as I said earlier, in 2019, you received the sort of, um, you know, the big award from um, the National Book Foundation at the National Book Awards ceremony. Um, you had some pretty priceless things to say there about the way that writers um, do or do not spend their days writing. Um, but uh, one of the things that you talked about and is sort of akin, I guess, to this UT um, situation is that I think you wrote four novels before your fifth one was the one that was published. Um, and that the, the earlier four, you know, they had gay characters um, and that you knew gay editors in the publishing world, but they were afraid to take on the book in case other people would know that the editor himself was gay. Um, That's right. And so all, this, all before Stonewall in the 60s yeah. before beginning of gay liberation. Yeah. yeah. So that, uh, you know, the people later would say to me, oh, I really liked your book, but uh, I didn't dare speak out for it because it would have ruined my reputation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, but the relevant question for me there is that I think there would be plenty of writers. I mean, writing is so lonely and, you know, there was no um, editor who was, you know, dangling money over your head and said, you know, you must turn this in by a certain deadline. I mean, there are plenty of writers who would have given up after like the third novel. What, why did you, were you just so convinced you were a good writer? Like what, what, what kept you going? I think just stupidity. I, I, I mean, I think, <laughs> you know, I think if I had uh, been more clever, I would have become an electrical engineer like my father. But uh, mm-hmm. he wanted me to take over the family business. But uh, I don't know, I had this sort of blind, romantic ambition to be an artist. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I guess I just thought I was good or talented. I, but my, the first book that was published of mine was called Forgetting Elena. And that was different from the others because I thought to myself, well, if I'm never going to be published, I'll at least write a book that I would like to read. And so I wrote a rather spooky, difficult, avant-garde novel. And, uh, and that's the one that was published. But it was turned down by 22 publishers. And the only reason it got published is because Richard Howard, the translator and Pulitzer Prize winning poet, read it and he liked it. And he went back to Random House who had already rejected it and said, oh, you're complete fools. This is a masterpiece. You must publish it. And so they did. And then Howard sort of became a mentor or or a good friend to you, right? For a while, and then not, uh, because I had a a kind of awful dispute with Susan Sante, uh, and he took her side uh, rather than mine, Uh, but she immediately dropped him too, so (laughs) anyway, uh, I I loved Susan and never wanted to have a a, a fight with her, but it just Mm -hmm. turned out that way. Did you read um, Ben Moser's bio of Sontag? I did, and I, I'm a little bit quoted in there, and mm-hmm. I, I liked it very much. I thought it was a brilliant book, and uh, he's very sophisticated, and he was the perfect person to write it. He lives in um, in the Netherlands and mm-hmm. in France, and he speaks all those languages. And he wrote a book about the Brazilian, a Brazilian writer, and mm-hmm. and he learned Portuguese for that. I mean, he he's just one of those real culture vultures, the way Susan herself was. Yeah, and he's a native Texan, actually. He grew up in Houston. That's right. 
I would say the smartest people I know are Texas Jews, because uh, there's a guy called Ben Taylor, also a brilliant writer, who uh, has uh, who, who's from Fort Worth, and uh, th those guys, the, those two Bens and, and other friends of mine, are all brilliant Texas Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It turns out to be a good combination. Yes. So, um, you and I are both big fans of um, Alan Hollinghurst and his novels, and I just, I just wanted to ask you what what you admire about his work. This is um, a gay British writer um, who's been publishing novels what since probably like the mid '90s or so. Yeah, at least I wrote the, a review for the London Times. Uh, of his first book, uh, The Swimming Pool Library. And mm -hmm. uh, he had written a nasty review of A Boy's Own Story before that, but mm -hmm. that didn't stop me. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 uh, I wrote, and then eventually he, he, he decided that my book was a good one. Uh, it says you have a new message from Maritza. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll take care of that. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so then we became friends. And uh, the only difficult thing about him is he's a vegetarian. So you can't cook for him. And uh, when he comes to America, I, I have to take him to this one rather awful restaurant near here which is vegetarian mm -hmm. and, uh, but he, he oftentimes comes with uh, with a, a friend of his who writes operas uh, and uh, uh, Thomas Addis who who has had two big operas at the Metropolitan and mm -hmm. uh, and they even wrote and uh, one opera together. Uh, called Powder Her Nose, and uh, <laughs> it was very funny. And um, anyway, he's a great, a great sport, and he spent a lot of time in Texas, um, mm -hmm. calling her, because he taught, I think, in Houston. Yeah, yeah. No, I had interviewed him, and I was uh, surprised to find that out. So, um, you know, one of the things that is interesting to me about your career is I mean you've you've said stuff in France you've certainly said stuff in New York now you've said a novel in Texas and you know there's nothing wrong with regionalism I mean you know nobody ever said about Flannery O'Connor that oh my god I wish she just said a story in California you know I mean she's so much a product of her place and time but on the other hand you know, one of the things that seems admirable about your work is that you really seem to take the whole world as your as your canvas and as your setting. Um, and I wondered if, you know, you grew up in Texas in the Midwest. Did you ever feel like I'm a I'm a Midwestern writer, I'm a New York writer, or I'm a expatriate French writer? No, not really. No. I mean, I, I lived in Rome one year. I lived in San Francisco one year. I um, I lived in New York more than any other place, but New York always feels to me like a, a transient hotel where lots of people have lived there and the walls are all kicked in and, and nobody cares about, main, about maintaining it because it's full of transients. And mm -hmm. um, it's very hard, I think, to feel that one is a New York writer. Um, and um, I think the the city I found the most fascinating really was Rome, and it's the one I would like to go back to. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. What What do you love about it? I like uh, it's it's kind of a combination. Well, uh, Stendhal said uh, the French are the Italians in a bad mood, and uh, so. The Italians are the French in a good mood, 
and um, mm -hmm. th they're very friendly. They're very easygoing. They're very uh, warm and welcoming, but they're also slightly formal. It, it, Italy mm -hmm. has a wonderful combination of warmth and formality, which is a very rare one and, and one I happen to like. Yeah. So we've got a question from Loretta. She says, um, you mentioned reading devotionals to develop Yvette's character. Would you mind sharing other ways that you were able to move into and create her world? So for people who haven't read A Saint from Texas, this is the sister who um, goes the holy route and becomes um, a sister in Colombia. And she eventually has two miracles. I mean, uh, I had to read a lot about uh, about the church and I interviewed a, a priest in Rome and who was very closely attached to the Vatican. And I said to him, what do you have to do to become a saint? And he said, it's about $400,000. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, well, they have to do a, a lot of research. You have to write a thousand page biography and you have to certify the, the the miracles. Today, most of the miracles are medical miracles. Somebody mm -hmm. has cancer and you cure him. Uh, but um, uh, in the past, it wasn't true. I, I have an Italian friend who is a doctor and who had to certify certain medical miracles, which he was unable to do scientifically. And the church was furious at him. <clears throat> because they wanted this person to become a saint, and uh, but he he didn't see it as so miraculous. I mean, it was something that could have happened in the natural. Um, but the question is an interesting one that Loretta asked. Uh, I uh, I did interview lots of uh, people in the priesthood, and I. Uh, Certainly read a lot of devotional literature, and uh, and I tried imagining my way into a, a life of piety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how did that go for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but uh, I, I I had a. A friend, I have a friend from Colombia who uh, gave me tremendous details about the village where her, uh, where Yvette's uh, nunnery is. And uh, so anyway, I, as in so many cases, I leaned on my friend mm -hmm. for information. Yeah. And how long, um, a saint from Texas was fun to write. How long did it take you to to write? Two years. Mm -hmm. Is that pretty typical for you? Like, what what is it? Sort of a writing every day kind of process, or what, what's your what's your process? Well, now that I'm so old, I do write every day because I feel time's winged chariot. Uh, I used mm -hmm. to go. I I used to be an alcoholic, and so. Uh, I would write a chapter like the boys on story period. I would write a chapter and then think it was such a miracle that I would take off and go on a binge for another month. But mm -hmm. uh, not, but I stopped drinking in 83. And, uh, and then I shared an office with Joyce Carol Oates. And so that made me a lot more productive. And, <laughs> uh, and, I don't know. Uh, and then I've had a, two strokes and a heart attack, and that makes you more productive. Yeah. yeah. So we've got um, a question from Michael. He wants to know, does teaching help your writing or interfere with it? I think it really helps uh, because uh, you're constantly thinking about the technical problems of writing. and you know, you're always saying there should be more dialogue here. There should be uh, there should be some tension in this story. There there should be. I can't really see the characters. They're all talking in the dark. You need more descriptions. Uh, you um, 
you know, um, this story might be better if you just told it simply and chronologically rather than this complicated way you advise. And uh, and I don't know. I I think my main thrust as a teacher was to simplify everything, to try to make things uh, more clearer and simpler. And uh, but uh, and and I I think that influenced my own writing style. Yeah, it helped your own writing. Um, I want to read you something just a brief paragraph from my lives. This is your um, sort of legendary um, memoir. So this is um, a chapter titled My Women. If women are in love with me, they make me feel guilty. I believe that I should reciprocate their passion. And if I don't, I keep worrying that it's just obstinacy on my part. Even telling them I'm gay sounds to me like a nasty excuse. I scarcely believe it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I never reread my own writing, so that's why I laugh at it. Um, yeah, yeah I, th I think so. I mean, um, maybe because I grew up with a mother who was so desperate to remarry, but never could quite uh, uh, find a man to marry. Uh, I always thought, oh, you know, if we were all nice, we would fall in love with women and marry them because they they want to get married so badly. I mean, now everything has changed because of feminism and and Me Tooism and everything else. But uh, and people, oh, women are so much more independent. But when I grew up in the 50s, uh, it, it seemed very natural for women to expect to be proposed to. And I was engaged twice, and one of the women I was engaged to died, but uh, the other woman is still a very close friend of mine, and we talk to each other every week and see each other as often as possible. Oh, great. Nice. So I want to switch to contemporary gay, the contemporary gay writing scene. I mean, do, do you feel like it's a good scene? Like, is it thriving, and do we have kind of vital gay voices out there writing fiction? I think so. I think so, definitely. I mean, um, well, is obviously a wonderful writer who has a kind of long breath like Proust. I mean, he, he writes very long sentences, which are beautiful. And uh, I think that, uh, what's that uh, writer who, uh, I'm so I have such a bad memory. Uh, who who uh, is uh, Latino, and I think he is from Texas, and um, and he wrote We the Animals or something like that. Oh, Justin Torres. Yeah, I think he's an excellent writer. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a writer called John McManus, who uh, he is my writing buddy. That is. Every day I send, he's like my muse. I send four pages maybe to him, and he sends me four pages every day, and that's how we keep going. And we and we belong to the all praise club. We just say, oh, that's great. And uh, but actually, I do love his writing, and um, he's a very very funny writer, and a mm -hmm. wonderful one. So you know, uh, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, I think the gay literary scene is good. Uh, I love Edouard Louis, the French writer who mm -hmm. wrote the. I'm reading his newest book in French, hasn't been translated yet, which is about his mother. He's written about, about himself and about his father, and now this one about uh, his mother. And it's it's. It's so sad and so beautiful. He, you know, he's from a very working class, impoverished family. And yeah. I mean, his father was uh, injured as, an, as a, 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 a factory worker. And so they became absolutely desperately poor. And, um, and when he was about 24 and already a successful writer, his mother approached him and said, 
could I be your cleaning lady? I need a job. Hmm. Can you imagine the heartbreak of that? And yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, he writes in a beautiful way, very, very touchingly. And uh, I think he's a great writer. I, I, I think there are lots of writers that, in every country that are, are good. Yeah. I mean, I read, I, I'm the judge of a literary contest in Italy for the best mm-hmm. book translated from any country in the world into Italian that year. So mm-hmm. it's the best, it's not the best translation, but it's the best book. So I get to read a wide variety of books from Japan, from China, from mm-hmm. Germany, every place. And um, and uh, I feel that the world is sure is in a very good place. And gay literature yeah. is, is doing very well. Good. And so what was it like, um, I mean, we talked earlier, you, um, you know, read all these novels and they didn't get published and uh, you did break through with Forgetting Elena, but it was really a boy's own story um, that sort of puts you on the map, wouldn't you say? Yes, yes, definitely, mm-hmm. yeah. And w- what do you think it is about that book that that struck a chord with people? I think uh, a, a gay book about gay adults is very hard for uh, heterosexual readers to read. They, It seems like it's from Mars. I mean, because, you know, whereas let's say black novels uh, could be read by white readers because the experiences were the same, the children, deaths, uh, abortions, uh, divorce, all that stuff was the same. But uh, when gay people, not, now they're much more assimilating and more like their straight neighbors. But for the longest time, they were like total freaks taking drugs and being promiscuous and spending all their money on themselves. And, and uh, I don't know, I think, but a gay book about a young person, like A Boy's Own Story, who is struggling to find his identity is a book that teenagers, whether they're straight or gay, can read because they all have some sort of confusion about their uh, sexual identity. And I, and, and Boy's Own Story is very popular with straight readers in England, for instance. I mean, it sold 100,000 copies when it first came out. And, um, you know, I think that, and I've had black young men, 16 years old from Africa, write and say, I love Boys on the Story. It's just like my life. And I think, wait a minute, you're living now, and I was living in the 50s, and I was a privileged white person, and you're a black person in Africa. I don't know. But but I think people can identify with it because we all, or many of us, have the same struggles about uh, finding our identities. Yeah, yeah. And the book doesn't end on a sort of rosy, saccharine oh. note. I mean, it. Yeah. Not at all. Not so. <laughs> It's quite memorable I was never that way. The movie, I think, uh, because yeah. somebody said, oh, you, you know, your character turns nasty at the end of the book, and that's not the happy ending we want. So yeah. uh, no movies. So you've said before that there aren't enough gay villains in, in current gay fiction. Do you, I mean, it's it's an interesting question to ask now that we have the right to marry um, and that, you know, gay people don't have to live in a particular neighborhood in a city. As you said, we're sort of assimilated all over. Um, I mean, the bad old days of being discriminated against, I think, I think for some people they are not over, but, you know, we, we could speak in a very general sense that, um, that kind of bigotry, um, 
has disappeared somewhat. Do you do you think we've lost something in that bargain? No, I mean, because who cares about books? I mean, that that uh, they're pretty unimportant compared to life, and uh, yeah. and I think that the the new laws allowing gays to get married or to adopt children or uh, to be integrated into the community openly, all those laws have improved people's lives immensely. And maybe they've made uh, the writing a little less amusing, but I don't even, but anyway, that doesn't matter. I mean, writing, I think, mm -hmm. is unimportant compared to life. And um, uh, so, I don't know, uh, but I think like, uh, uh, I, I mean, I think there are some gay villains that are beginning to uh, come to light now. now. For instance, my friend John McManus is writing uh, about, uh, writing a book, a novel now, about a totally reprehensible uh, gay man who's sort of a scammer and who's in Africa and taking advantage of, of, of everybody's alarm over kill the gays, uh, bills in Uganda. And he's making a, a fortune reporting all that and in a totally cynical way. And uh, he's a totally cynical character and, and a real villain. And I don't think a gay writer would have dared to write that in the past because we were always told that we had to show positive role models. I, I think probably in the same way that uh, in the early days of, of, of black writing that was crossover, that blacks were urged to show uh, each other in the best possible light. And Philip Roth, for instance, was attacked for uh, his showing uh, that Portnoy was a sexual being, and uh, that was supposed to be letting his letting Gentiles see a bad side of Jewish life. And mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I think that at, as the as various minorities mature, the the laws become more lax and or more broad, more accepting. Yeah. So. Um... Everybody who's watching, uh, if you have any last minute questions, um, put them in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to those. So, um, you know, you're on a real um, writing binge, like you're, you're writing quite a lot. What what uh, what can we expect next? Well, I have a book uh, called A Previous Life, which uh, in which there's a minor character called Edmund White. And he, uh, uh, it's the first time I've ever written about myself, not at saying I, 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 because I've written several mm -hmm. autobiographies, probably too many. But, uh, but I, I, for the first time, I perceived myself as a kind of funny character uh, and from the outside. And uh, it, it's, it's a story of a very unhappy love affair. But, uh, but, and the characters are all polyamorous, which means they're not gay or straight, they're both, they're bisexual. And, um, uh, and uh, my own great nephew uh, who lives in Barcelona is polyamorous. I mean, he's engaged to a girl, but they have sex with members of the same sex too. And they're very proud of it. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, and I think that like about 60% of students now say that they are bisexual. Mm -hmm. But how does that strike you? I mean, you, you did come of age and you have written about coming of age at a time when if you, if you, if your great nephew had confessed that to you or anyone else, he could be in serious trouble. Um, and now people proclaim it quite proudly. I mean, it's been a while, but like, does that nonetheless, does it strike you as a significant um, societal change or shift? I think it's good. Uh, I mean, I think it's uh, very, very good that 
uh, people feel that freedom. And uh, I, I'm all for saying the truth mm -hmm. about yourself and in fiction, uh, you know, just being honest. Yeah. I think I'm more yeah. honest in my writing than I am in my life. I mean, I, I, I'm much more likely to write about one of the bizarre things I've done than to actually tell somebody else. That would make me blush and feel strange. But I can write about it. I'm kind of literary exhibitionist. Now, here's a yeah. question. What kind of research did you do for this book? Did you have to augment your knowledge of Texas with research? Yes, I mean, one of the books I read is um, the wonderful three-volume biography of Johnson and uh, uh, President Johnson, who was actually a friend of my uh, of my grandfather, and uh, uh, and and some parts of his life are paralleled by the father in my book. Uh, I mean, they grow up in the Texas Hills and uh, south of uh, Austin. And mm -hmm. there'll be like one newspaper that comes to the whole town. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, uh, that, that, or, or that both Johnson and the grandfather and, I mean, the, yeah, the father in my book, uh, put themselves through college and they worked, they did hard labor uh, building roads. And, you know, that kind of uh, colorful detail, I, I picked up from that marvelous biography. Yeah. No, and yeah, we hope, um, we hope those of us in Texas, certainly many other readers who are not in Texas, hope that Cairo comes out with the um, final volume of the biography soon. Every Christmas, I have dinner with Robert Caro, and uh, you he's, yes, mm -hmm. he, he's a wonderful man. And we always say we'll get together soon, and we never do. We only see each other at Christmas, but yeah, uh, that's a treat. That's a wonderful treat. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, spending time with us. I loved uh, a saint from Texas. Thank you for writing about Texas, and. Uh, Thank I'm you eager for to read your message. Program and asking me good questions. Yeah. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, don't forget to um, buy um, Edmund's new book through Nowhere Bookshop. Um, we've got a whole other day of the festival tomorrow, so we hope you come back and experience some more great events tomorrow. Thanks to Edmund and thanks to you all for attending, and uh, have a good night. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks. <laughs>